So I thought, it, rather than starting with the assumption that everybody in the room is a data scientist, I thought it would be good to try and demystify a little bit about data science and machine learning in particular. Um, and you know, I, I'll start by you know, doing what I call buzzword bingo. You'll walk around to all the booths here, and you'll hear every kind of term thrown around. Um, anywhere from you know, data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, which are kind of like these top level things, and then Lots of different algorithms, you know. The in vogue one these days is uh, deep learning. Um, you'll hear about supervised versus unsupervised, data lakes, um, TensorFlow. Does everybody know what TensorFlow is? We'll explain it a little as we go along. And what are GPUs and what are TPUs and why do we care in the context of machine learning? So, let's start with just the foundations. The first question you have to ask yourself, so machine learning is really letting code or programs understand what they're supposed to do by looking at data, rather than having a human write code to say if then else. So that's it at a top level. Now, the foundational approaches fall roughly into two categories. Is it supervised or unsupervised? What does that mean? It basically, generally in the case of supervised, it means you create some piles of data you label them maybe good or bad, or you label them A, B, C, D. And then you take an algorithm and you extract variables out of those data piles, and you try and basically learn by virtue of seeing the data to classify something as A, B, C, or D, or classify something as good or bad. So this is basically coming up with a percentage likelihood that something is good or bad, or falls into a particular pile. Unsupervised, on the other hand, is I just have one pile of data. I just have one large pile of data, it hasn't been labeled, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and organize it in such a way that I can cluster it together, and I can figure out what is a normal baseline out of that data, and so subsequently when I see some other data, I can describe it as abnormal within the context of the data that I'm looking at, or I can describe it as being an outlier. In other words, it is at the fringes of that data set as opposed to within the core of that data set. Now, one of the key questions you always have to ask yourself is when there is labeling involved, is it your job to do the labeling or is it the vendor's job to do the labeling? Right, because whenever you hear about machine learning where you're training the algorithm, you're effectively labeling data. You're saying, this is good, I want more of this, less of that. You're doing the labeling. Now, um, algorithms, there are lots and lots of different algorithms. Naive Bayes is kind of the, the, the the core building block that a lot of uh, machine learning has been built around over the, time, over the years. There are decision trees, random forest being the most common of those. There is recursive Bayesian estimation where you use basically um, some of the Bayesian techniques in a recursive way, so feedback on itself. K-means is the, is the most common clustering technique where you try and cluster data and find outliers. Deep learning is the in vogue method um, of the last few years. So this is a reboot of neural networks. So you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard, heard of neural nets, but the idea is basically to try and build systems that function almost like the human brain, a very small section of the human brain, because quite frankly, the human brain has billions and billions of uh, neurons in it. Uh, here you can have feed forward or recurrent networks. So feed forward basically is a single pass where you go through a series of, of layers of neurons. Recurrent basically has loops back where the current data is really considered in the context of data that has just gone before it. So these are all successively more complicated, more rich, more computationally intense mechanisms to basically try and apply to either supervised or unsupervised. So deep learning does not mean it's unsupervised. It can be applied to both. So having that foundation in place, now think about what might happen. So if an adversary wants to attack you, how might they do that? So there are global data sets. What, what global data sets exist? There's obviously a global data set of for instance, things that are known to be malware. If you go to a, a place called VirusTotal that Google runs, you can get a list of every known piece of malware that is out there in the public domain and what each 
uh, AV engine and sandbox thinks about it. So what might you do? One of the things you can do is basically pollute um, the malware archives by, by, if you're the bad guy, injecting legitimate software in. So now you're basically, say, you're basically tagging legitimate software as something bad and having basically a whole bunch of algorithms decide now this good thing is bad, which makes the system less trustworthy. Or you can put malware out there but have legitimate techniques in it in order to kind of make those legitimate techniques now become more suspect. Um, you can also take pseudo-legitimate, like potentially unwanted programs like PUPs, and you can put them out there as things that, that basically use certain techniques um, in, an, in order to kind of make these techniques, again, considered to be more acceptable in the, in the actual world. IP and domain reputation systems are another aspect, right? So again, machine learning can be used to look at executables, it can be used to look at communications, it can be used to look at logs, you can apply it to all sorts of problems. For IP and domain reputation systems, the main thing you do is you distribute malware that communicates to legitimate places. If all the malware that comes out suddenly starts communicating with Facebook, does that mean Facebook is bad? Does that mean if I see something communicating to Facebook that it's malware? So you start creating effectively these doubts, not in the humans necessarily, but in the machine learning. And you can also try and overwhelm, overwhelm the existing ML. So if you know that a particular security product tries to do labeling after clustering, what you basically are going to do is you're going to cause their scoring system to have lots of outliers that fall outside the clusters to force them to have to do manual labeling. So recognizing what the vendor's um, mechanisms are and what their workflow is causes you to be able to basically uh, throw monkey wrenches into their process. There's also a question of local data pollution. So if I'm running inside your network, if I'm, looking, uh, if I'm inside your sandbox looking just at your data set, not looking at a global data set, data lakes are kind of these, the, the invoke term for this. It's like, I'm an enterprise, I'm going to dump all my data into a data lake, which is a fancy word for saying a large distributed file system. So, when you're collecting, say, 500 gigabytes of data a day locally in your network from endpoints, from network devices, et cetera, and dumping it into a data lake, it's very hard to scrub that data on the way in. So if you're an attacker, what do you try and do? You try and take two or three um, compromised nodes and use them to basically flood the data lake with suspect data. Now, your actual attacking node may be some other node, Right, so you're basically creating, using sleight of hand, basically creating a diversionary tactic to basically make that data lake seem less trustworthy because it now has dirty data inside of it. And the one other thing you can do, which is the more subtle thing, is to also just gradually move the baselines of what is considered normal, right? So if you think about learning over long term based on local behavioral patterns, the question really is, how slow does the movement have to be to not raise an alarm? So if you're willing to, to be patient as an attacker and do this over a three month period, you can gradually move the baseline to the point where what you want to do is no longer considered sufficiently abnormal to warrant basically a alert and investigation. The one other thing you have to think about in attacking systems in general is, is there a feedback loop? So, this has been true for age immemorial, even before ML. If you have something inside, in line, that you are basically attacking, every time you try something, you effectively get, have a feedback system. Because like, if the thing is blocked, that tells you, OK, that was too far. On the other hand, if you're passive, it's a lot harder to attack a system that is basically, think of it as a silent alarm as opposed to a loud alarm. Whatever you've done at any given moment in time, you don't know whether it has raised the alarm or not. And so you have to be much more circumspect in attacking the systems. So when you have ML in, the same principles apply. What you really want to know is you know, whether the systems that you have are providing a feedback loop to the attacker, where the attacker can tell whether something succeeded or failed or whether they're just raising silent alarms and not being in line and causing any kind of change in action. 
So um, what is the original? So th the other thing to think about is you know, data sources. So when you think about you know, doing stuff in, in, from a machine learning perspective, what you're basically doing is you are having the data train the program, right? So there's not, not a human now involved in writing if-then-else logic. So the data can train the algorithm, but it can also fool the algorithm. So you have to be really careful about where you're getting your data from. Like, think of it this way. If you're, doing, if you're in the world of advertising or if you're in the world of social networking and you're using machine learning, you, you're not in an adversarial system. Right? If I'm, if I'm a data scientist for LinkedIn, my job in life is to basically try and connect you with people that may have shared interests with you. The problem in InfoSec is when you use ML, you're using ML against, another advers against an adversary who may also be using ML themselves and who also is trying to pollute your data sets to make you less effective. So be careful about your data. So there's an example of this, and this has ha actually happened in the real world. You have a threat feed. You're buying a threat feed from a company, okay? That threat feed, unbeknownst to you, is really not a pure threat feed that the company is creating, but it's taking a lot of tributary data sets from other sources into that threat feed. So it is, in some senses, in some sense, it becomes an opinion of an opinion of an opinion, right? Now. It turns out that that vendor who's producing that thread feed looks at things and says, well, I've get, I'm getting these 10 additional thread feeds in. If four of them vote that something is bad, it must mean it's bad. Or if four of them vote that something is good, it must be good. However, um, the conclusion that they're drawing is actually flawed because they are getting their opinions, th th their, their opinion is based on the opinions of people above them. Those guys above them are getting data, are basically operating off of the same data sources. So what could be happening is that a single data source at the very top, as it branches out, appears to be four data sources. They all seem to vote that, yes, this is something good or something bad. It gets down to the next layer. Oh, four data sources said something is good or something is bad. Therefore, thumbs up. It's bad, it, it's good, or it's bad. And so you come to the conclusion that a lot of your parts of your systems agree on something when in fact they are all stemming from one data source at the very top of the tree. So your thread feeds ML then is operating off of a lot less data than it thinks. It's like this one piece of data that branched out and then came back together. And so if the attacker hits that top of the supply chain, right, your thread feed basically ends up getting polluted. And that pollution can basically play out in two ways. It can either, either result in a lack of coverage in an area or a large number of false positives in an area. And both of those are useful to attackers. Like if you're an attacker, knowing that something will not trigger an alarm or knowing that an area, a large area, will trigger lots of alarms is almost equally valuable. Because if it's going to trigger a lot of alarms, and the customer looks at them, and the majority of them are false positives, they will consider the attacker's data point in there a false positive as well. And obviously, if it's not triggering an alarm at all, then it doesn't show up on the radar at all. So both of those are common techniques. So how will attackers then use ML to their own advantage? So one thing they can basically do is, rather than just polluting your data set, they want to use machine learning as their own tech. So one of the things you can actually do is you can extract a lot of data out of something like VirusTotal and construct your own machine learning to figure out what combinations of factors are likely to make something like a C2 endpoint not show up in a place like VirusTotal. So rather than trying to manually say if then else, you're going to take that data set and build your attack campaign using that data set. So the other thing that you can imagine is that given access to an actual security product, so think of a black box from a testing perspective. I don't know quite how this security product is working. It's maybe using machine learning. I can use like almost gaming concepts to try and play a game against that technology and find the edges of where its effectiveness are. 
Now, there are ways that we utilize ML to try and prevent that. Um, there, there's a technique basically called ad adversarial machine learning where you basically build your system using ML and then you build a counter system using ML that tries to break that system and you continually improve basically your coverage of your core algorithm based on game playing against an adversary that is also driven by ML. So there are good ways of trying to protect your product against that, um, but, but that's basically um, you know, what vendors have to do now, here are some questions to ask yourself. If you're purchasing ML, if you're walking down the floor here and somebody's trying to sell you, basically, our product does machine learning or it does AI, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, what data is it using as input and what goal is it trying to achieve? So is it, is it pulling in execution traces out of a sandbox and trying to tell you that a particular executable is bad? Is it pulling in NetFlow records off of the network and trying to tell you that a particular communication is bad? Is it looking at your C2 communication across your perimeter and tell, trying to point out which ones are C2 and which ones are not? So be clear in understanding beyond the machine learning, what are the inputs and what is the output that they're trying to create? Secondarily, once you understand that, ask them where they get their data from. Like what data are they using? Where do they get it from? How much of it do they actively operate on? Again, if you're buying a threat feed, are you buying a threat feed for executables or, or for um, C2 communications from a company that runs their own malware in sandboxes or are you buying from an aggregator, right? So understand exactly what it is they do versus what they aggregate and how they ensure that it's not polluted. Like, how do they actually, what are the techniques that they're utilizing to ensure that that pollution doesn't occur? Secondarily, if you're building your own ML, I mean, I sometimes see customers say this to me. It's like, I've hired a data scientist. I'm half the way there to my own machine learning, right? Here again, ask yourself, how good is your data science team? If you've hired some guy out of life sciences, they don't know info, information security from anything, right? They're used to dealing with DNA, um, this is a slightly different problem space. You need subject matter expertise married to the data science. You can't simply just look at it as data. How do you ensure that you, the integrity of your data, again, how you, if you're collecting a data lake or if you're collecting a more modest set, how do you ensure the integrity of that data? And then does the data include the right features? So if you're trying to basically determine that something is bad in your environment, are you even collecting the right data and extracting the right sets of features, which are just the variables out of that data set to be able to do things? Finally, ML, AI, data science is all about what I call ambiguous security. This is not about black or white, it's good or bad. This is a 98% likelihood that that doesn't look really good. Is your team capable of carrying the load the rest of the way. Your IR team, in order to utilize any of these technologies, whether you're building them or buying them, needs to be able to deal with ambiguity. This is never going to be black or white, but black or white only gets you so far. Ambiguity is what you need to be able to deal with. And so whenever you're buying machine learning, think of that, think about your internal team, think about your internal posture, think about the type of people that you have, this is not about CVE numbers. This is about that does not look right. And what are you going to be able to do with that information? Are you going to be able to mobilize around that and do the rest of the IR in order to be able to accomplish the goal? Thank you.